there's many different discussions that we have over the course of this pork fest, uh, all those discussions that we had on the way here, agreements uh, that we made with people. There were many dialogues, right? Maybe it was a, a family who had to have a longer discussion about the logistics, things like that, children, right? Who's got children? Anybody? Yes. So it's important to have really good communication, right? Why? So that you can get be heard, be understood, and you can also hear and understand others. So the movement is about people, right? And are the relationships that we create amongst each other and the relationships we have with ourselves about life in general, right? What, what are we doing here? Are we, we feel impelled to do great things with our lives or just kind of just enjoy and, you know, what the hell? I let everything, it's not my problem, so I won't get involved, right? It's a choice every step of the way, or that balance between family and and uh, your personal life and your mission. So, how do we talk? How do we get going as far as actually uh, actually creating a tight working team of people? Because a very large group is quite ungainly. Anybody work in large groups? You know, the Occupy movement or anything like that. It gets to be, whew, yeah, it's yeah. And so much of it, because uh, length of time and having to discuss things ends up being majority rule, right? A lot of times. Now, Occupy did a lot of consensus, but, you know, it was hard with large groups. Uh, there's a fellow called um, John David Garcia, wrote a book called Creative Evolution. And he did lots of research over a number of decades. And the fellow who wrote this book, Flourish, uh, worked with him and uh, was talking about human potential. How can we bring out the most in ourselves and in working situations? And uh, John David Garcia had a lecture once um, that other people had organized. There was maybe 500 people there. And uh, he asked the audience, uh, who's ready to change the world? Right? Who's ready to change the world here? Cool. All right? Those people who raised their hand, it was about 20 people, said, okay, come on up on stage. They came up on stage, and he proceeded to only talk to them. And they go, what's going on? Hey, they were ready to change the world. Nobody else is. I'm going to deal with people that want to change, want to do something. So this is kind of his radical approach. Hey, let's work with the people that are going to make it happen, including yourself. So he found that there's a... Certain types of combinations of people can create very creative ideas, right? But we'd also like those ideas to be of a consensus basis, you know, or the, the uh, solutions that you come up with, the decisions you make to be consensus, wholeheartedly, own unanimous decisions, preferably, right? And so what is that magic number that they found out? It's kind of like a bell curve of sorts. And they found that, you know, the numbers are, this is creativity, all right? This is numbers of people, all right? With a few people, you know, the creativity came up, but, you know, uh, there wasn't quite enough to uh, ha have as much creativity as when you had maybe eight, eight people. Now, if you got eight people, the creativity, or more than eight people, the, the um, consensus, ability to make consensus decisions went down, right? So there are fewer, fewer consensus decisions for the amount of people involved. In other words, their maximum number, they figured, was eight. Four men, four women, and uh, if you had, say, 32 people, you'd have four groups of eight. Better break them up into small groups. Much easier to come to consensus decisions. Now, the other thing that he discovered uh, is that it's so important to talk about why it is you're coming, getting together. What are the core beliefs, values, ethics, if you will, that you can all agree on? Because when a group's been in existence for a while, whether it's a rock band or a sports team or, or a, you know, action group, it's the ethics that often break you apart later. The arguments about what you do and maybe not right or appropriate or, you know, in view of overall human values and how you interact with society. So. What are those principles that we can all agree on? Okay, non-aggression principles, one of those, right? But it gets deeper than that. And he goes into a whole series 
of different concepts that can be an alternative to government and other hierarchies. And he calls this group that thwarts the progress of humankind, the Borg. Bureaucrats organize religion and government. <laughs> Aren't they like the Borg? <laughs> right? So, um, they do all they can to be, be very unified, work in small groups, and come up with decisions that they wholeheartedly believe in, and, uh, right, and agree on, for their own power and wealth, right? Well, we can do the same thing if we learn how to communicate better. You know, learn how to communicate and learn some processes by where, which we can create an environment of a discussion, in a discussion, that allows for diversity of expression. Hey, Alex Jones has one, you know, um, powerful style. You know, missionary. Didn't like his style at all, but he has great information, right? And so that's a diverse uh, expression. Some people may be very, so quiet and you have to draw it out of them, right? So if you have a bunch of people, uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight. Each one of those can add to the meeting and create a synergy of ideas that can be very exciting, right? Has to create, but the core principle in there is ethics. It draws you together. Why you're to there, and all right. So, uh, by the way, the eight um, in the group that they mentioned, four men, four women. They found that it was the uh, best combination. Now, you can have fewer. You can have more. But that's something you look at when you have the option of how to break into groups and see if it works for you. So the, uh, the ethics that he talks about are um, uh, who's been in like, um, teams of people that are like about 10, 12 or something like that working on a project. Okay, so did you use um, majority rule typically or Robertson's rules of order? Was it by consensus then? Some, some, some people would, um, there were quiet people that would go along, and every once in a while they would speak up, and then everybody listened because they hardly ever spoke up. Okay, some people hardly spoke up. And so their way would go along until there was some resistance, and it just played out. So it played out? It's messy, but it's better. Yeah, it takes a little longer. So he was talking about the diversity of styles with his own group, right? That, and it was messy, but it uh, worked out, you know, just, what was the main feature tolerance right tolerance patience yep so uh, patience right kind of taught if you can't understand the style maybe it just has to be tolerance of their style right all right and perseverance so the idea is to invite people to your group who uh, have not only skills, but a similar kind of ethical understanding, and you have a conversation about it. And uh, when you have like brainstorming sessions, for instance, or brain writing or whatever, if you can do it in a way that supports your uh, this environment, then people are more than likely to feel anxious or that they're not being heard. Now, of course, having um, uh, good meeting process skills certainly helps, right? You have an agenda. Who was at the, uh, the facilitation meeting uh, earlier in the week? Is there anybody here who was at that? Okay. So the idea of the octologue, let me just step back a little bit. Uh, the idea of the octologue is to not only just form a, um, a group yourself, because you know, eight people can only do so much as well. You can form alliances with other groups, with other groups who also uh, have similar ethical values, right? And you interact to do a certain type of transaction between you. Like, I've got, a, I can hand around this chart here. There could be a coordination between different uh, action teams, and one group's working on, say, public relations, right? Whereas somebody else is working on government liaison, right? Or, or uh, watching the, the officials and what they're deciding on, right? Very different approach. Someone else could be just lurk, working on the legal aspect. So each of these groups themselves can be a small group 
focused on an area, right? To be eight of them, for instance. And each of these makes decisions by consensus. So in that way, we could build a society from the ground up by consensus, by you know, voluntary interaction that, you know, it's much more a stable figure, right? Like a chair with three legs. You ever sit in a chair with three legs? It's a <laughs> but five, they're great. Uh, so let me um, read a couple of things in here. This is from Robert Podolsky. By the way, he was the, uh, the, uh, the um, son of um, Boris Podolsky, who was, uh, Boris Podolsky was part of the Podolsky, Rosen, Einstein group of physicists. And this is his son who wrote a book. Uh, he was a physicist himself for a while. Very thoughtful fellow. And uh, he has a code of ethics in here. Uh, no, I don't. So one of the concepts was, um, if you're doing the right action, how to determine the right action? Right in a group. Well, um, one definition is an act is good if it increases creativity or any of its logical equivalents for at least one person, including the person acting, without limiting or diminishing creativity for anyone else. Okay, now what, what, what's the logical equivalence? What's creativity? Inc includes love, awareness, personal evolution, uh, the avail availability of objectively true information to ethical persons, and possibly many other resources. The ones that are not, you know, you don't necessarily want to, necessar uh, to increase the level of freedom for all people, because giving more freedom if somebody wants to, you know, murder people is not a good idea. Giving people directions how to, they're going to put off a bombing in a crowded, crowded place. Not a good idea, right? So you don't necessarily want to increase freedom as a core concept unless you really get specific, right? But as a general overall rule, increasing love, awareness, personal evolution, hard to argue with that. Um, and these are, uh, so freedom, privacy, honesty, empathy, consciousness, energy, wealth, profit, and even happiness are hard to have as a, strictly speaking, um, set of creativity and tendencies resources that will be in all cases um, beneficial to you and the society around you. So it takes a longer discussion, but with patience, it's a whole lot a whole lot easier. Have you been in environments where you've been the only one who's been brought up a point and you felt, mm, how am I get nobody's agreeing with me, they're not quite getting it. Does that ever happen to anybody? Right? And so, uh, how to do this now? How do you do that when you're the only one there? Do you feel like you have to defend yourself? Defend that idea? A good question, Kevin. And, you know, I, I think that uh, it's important to experience some empathy with the people that you're with. So if you can say something that you feel like you know will resonate with others, then it's okay maybe to add the piece that you don't, you know won't. You know, like they say, you, you know, you deliver feedback in a sandwich where, you know, here's the good, now there's this little piece that you didn't do, and now here's another good, right? So you got it all, and you know, I think you need like two strokes for every reprimand or whatever. And so that's, I think that the, the important thing, I, you know, I just add to that piece about, you know, love and understanding and all that hippie stuff, you know, it's like, you just gotta know where people are coming from, right? You gotta recognize that, that's, that's just being aware, right? Any other thing anybody wants to add to that? So I'd like to get, do a little bit of how that can really work. Let's get down to something concrete here. Having a meeting, right? You put out an agenda. That's well, kind of a basic. Agenda air to everyone first. Okay, everybody has the opportunity to put on the things that are to be talked about in advance. We have the, the meeting. Okay. Uh, 
It starts, and what do you do at the start of the meeting? Have different people do different jobs, okay? For instance, uh, facilitation, for instance, someone who does not involve themselves in the conversation, but helps, helps the discussion flow amongst everyone. So that's the facilitator. And then, uh, who else would be good to have as a person? Note taker. A note taker, excellent. Notes, right? And who also then um, may check in with you as far as the accuracy of the decisions made, right? And then um, also a timekeeper. Because in the agenda, you're going to have one, two, three, four, five points. Prioritize them. Maybe the most important one is this one, right? And then this one. Might be some funny order, you know? Whatever. Well, I've got it mixed up. Uh, anyways, you get the idea. Um, and so, yeah, and then you allot time because you want the meeting to start on time, you want it to end on time. In respect to everyone. You can also negotiate for a longer time, of course, if something takes longer. But then you allot a certain amount of time to each, and the timekeeper then can tell you when it's five minutes or two minutes up, and then it's time. And it helps people to be succinct and uh, think about what they're going to say before they talk. And they, people are more likely to come to the meeting next time because, hey, they were able to schedule it properly, starting and end times. And then also for something called the Vibes Watcher is very good. The vibes Watcher, if there's a number of people, okay, who wants to say, have a comment on this one point, four people raise their hand, the Vibes Watcher can say, okay, let's put it down, who are those people on stack? In other words, one, two, three, four, okay? Very respectful to uh, the group, and it's a way of building small consensus decisions all the way through the process. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if, if, if you've got people that you know are like in habitual conflict, you, you know, the Vibes Watcher can do something like say, hey, you know, why don't you guys talk about that offline? You know, so we're not going to get caught up in the usual, you know, debate. You know, I mean, you know, you guys have this all day long, so, you know, let's do it later and not take up the time. Yeah, exactly. So, so you go through your meeting and then you have um, different points, and, and I'm just giving you a real simple, there's a lot, a lot more to this, of course, but uh, at least some structure like this. At the end, you have a uh, uh, summary. Summary of the points that you decided on, with a timeline, who's going to do it, what well, they're going to do it until next time, and uh, closing, some kind of, oh, I forgot, it's nice to have some kind of warm-up, uh, warm as in trust exercises or, you know, some kind of social, some way of meeting together as just people, and then doing the same thing at the end, having a closing of what went well and what didn't go well for the meeting. Simple, but uh, very effective for uh, having people come back to your next meeting, right? They feel like they participated. Oh, the Vibes Watcher can also encourage those who haven't spoken for a while uh, to speak up, or if there's a sensitive point, and say, oh, let's, uh, could you say more about that? Yeah, well, let's talk about it a little bit more. Um, and, um, yeah, who's, who's facilitated meetings before, anybody? Yeah, you have, good, all right. And, uh, and consensus decisions need not always be unanimous. A consensus could be somebody decides not, I don't want to stand in the way of the decision, it's not a big deal for me, right? Or it could be something you know, minor, like where do we go for lunch? Right? And uh, that, by all means, you do by uh, majority rule, or unless somebody really strongly against it. Now, there's some, anybody um, heard of range voting? You have? Okay. Range voting is that, say you have, um, uh, like the restaurant situation, you've got five really good restaurants you decide are good. Each person gets five stars, and you can put stars, one star on all of them, four on one and one on another, depending on your preference, how strong your preference is for a certain restaurant. And then the one that with the most stars, uh, that's the one by popular demand is uh, that you go to. Yeah. Annoy. Paramount objections. You ever heard of that? Like, you know, I, I just 
won't go to that freaking place, right? They, they diss me before or they have some kind of policy that I really object to. Paramount objection is like, you know, the, the piece of consensus that I like because it says, you know, like you said, small potatoes, I can live with this, but, you know, if, if we're going to go with this decision, you know, I, I can't live with it. So a paramount objection can block consensus. Blocking a consensus is a sort of a wake-up call. Hey, I got a really something important to say. Maybe I haven't said it yet, or I haven't, yeah, haven't been able to understand because I haven't explained it the way. I don't understand enough about your understanding process to express it your way. You know, so let's vary it a little bit, and a facilitator can help bring that out. Or maybe you go into small groups and have an opportunity to each group to talk about it from this other person's point of view and bring it back because. If you can get that last person, because you don't want them to leave, right? They, they've, and that's more for major decisions, you know, a lot amount of money or resources being poured into a specific project or moving the location of your business and all those things. Did you want us to add something? I was just saying, in Occupy, I went to Occupy Boston when the Occupy movement was flourishing all over the country. And I uh, participated in some consensus decisions, and the block was a key thing that came up. If someone could not live with something, you need to take it back to the drawing board and come up with something that can then be brought before. And have you heard of T.E. Lawrence Butler? He did a lot of work on consensus. I met him at Occupy Boston, and he's written a couple of books, some Consensus for Cities, and I think uh, Consensus in, I uh, forget his first book, which was far more popular. I have both of them in the home. And they're really good. You're teaching a very similar pattern as to what he did. And uh, it's great in intentional communities, and it works for movements. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, uh, certain organizations are using it big time. I mean, how many people are on the Navy SEAL team? Isn't it eight? G8 Summit, um, sports teams, you know, have about 12, right? So there's something about that synergy that develops. And uh, yeah, exactly. And learning more of these skills, a very good book for that is uh, Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision Making. So it's, look up Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision Making. Yeah, a lot of great techniques in there about how to bring out the most in a group. You know, we like variety, you know, especially of a long-term uh, group. You want to have some variety in how it is you come up with creative solutions. So, um, so you're talking about oh, and other businesses uh, that have done this more peer uh, type of uh, interactions is Gore International. Gore International has, uh, has 10,000 employees worldwide. And it's uh, they're uh, very well. Uh, doing fantastic as an organization. Employee satisfaction is very high. Everyone's an associate. It's not this hierarchical structure. Uh, Visa did the same thing. Uh, of sorts, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then uh, each, and I've seen other worker owned cooperatives sort of like that too. Uh, I worked at a restaurant actually in uh, Toronto, Canada back in the 70s. And they, it was a vegetarian restaurant, and we shared our tips also with the kitchen. Now that was different. Yeah, because then they had out in time, they were friendly, and they were getting tips too. Made it real pretty. That was fun. So a couple other points uh, here is up. Uh, we never attempt to achieve ethical, ethical ends by unethical means, right? So ethical means, ethical ends is what's got to be there as a basic tenet for the organization. We never lie, except in self-defense. In which case, lying may be mandatory. <laughs> we never coerce, except in self-defense. We never steal, destroy, limit, or diminish anyone's physical, tangible, mental, intellectual, temporal, or emotional resources. Don't steal, right? Never invade another's property. We never excuse our own ethical lapses, right? That's a hot one. <laughs> right? Never destroy, limit, or avoid. avoid corrective feedback. And it goes on. Oh, never employ a majority rule. So there's uh, other ways of doing it.